Hey, welcome to Church Online. My name is Bianca and I'm so happy to welcome you here to Church Online this weekend. At New Beginnings Church across all of our campuses, we are taking communion together. And this morning, or whenever you're watching, wherever you're watching, you're gonna hear a powerful communion message from our lead pastor, Joe Source. We love getting together and celebrating and remembering everything Jesus did for us at the cross. And um, we're taking communion today, so if you want to pause and go get the communion elements, that would be awesome, whether it's juice, water, crackers, whatever you feel comfortable taking communion with, we would love to take communion together with you at Church Online. And if it is your first time here, we would love to meet you, get to know you a little bit better. If you're watching on our Church Online platform, the connect with us button right above me is what you're gonna to wanna to click. And if you're watching on YouTube, the link to our digital connect card is right in the description below. And every weekend across all of our campuses, we love to continue worshiping God with our tithes and offerings, our giving. And anytime I'm hosting Church Online, I love to just give a huge thank you to everybody who calls New Beginnings Church home and faithfully gives. You make church possible. Your obedience to God's word makes it possible for us to bring the good news of Jesus to anyone and everyone who walks through our doors, sees us on social media, watches Church Online. So thank you so much for your faithful giving. And it is super Super easy to give if you've never given with us online. If you're watching on our church online platform, the give button is right above me. And if you're watching on YouTube, the link to give is right in the description below. And before we get into pastor's communion message and before we take communion together, we're just gonna watch some church news. There's a lot of awesome stuff coming up at New Beginnings Church. stories that have a happy ending don't feel like it along the way. We borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. Want a new car? Go finance it. My whole philosophy was credit cards. I'll just work another week. <sighs> Swipe the card. Everything kind of started to crash. We started to see our marriage drop away. I personally owed $750,000 in debt. I was totally hopeless. You need to decide if you want to be wealthy or if you want to look wealthy. When somebody told me about FPU, I grabbed hold of it like a life preserver. It gave me hope that we could make our marriage work. Knowing where your money's going is a huge life changer. Nobody owns me anymore. Nobody. It just opened up communication big time. All of a sudden, we were back together on a crusade. We changed our family tree. I am here to do my debt-free screen. Yeah, how much have you paid off? Four hundred and fifty-six thousand. Eighty-nine thousand. One hundred and twenty thousand. Three hundred ninety-four thousand dollars. Three, two, one. one. Woo! This financial peace stuff is working. People are getting out of debt and they're becoming millionaires. We are the first generation that are millionaires. And we've given more than we ever imagined we could yeah. give. I now have a net worth of $1.7 million. Hope is real. God is always right. God doesn't say, oh, well, well, wait a minute now. I think I was mistaken. No, he's always right. He's always right. We're the ones that are learning from him. Isn't it amazing that the longer you live in the Lord, the more and more you realize how much you didn't know? It's all progressive revelation. What we learn today, it's a foundation for tomorrow and the tomorrow we have to, and the tomorrow. We're constantly growing until the day I go on to be with glory. I want to know more and more. How about you? I want to know more and more about the God that saved me and put his presence on the inside of me. Welcome everyone. This is communion weekend here at New Beginnings. This is the time that we come together around the Word of God in order for us to prepare our hearts 
so that when we take communion together, we're doing it, number one, in the faith. We're doing it with a fuller understanding of what the word says about communion so that we could receive all the benefits that Jesus desires for us to receive when we come together in remembrance of him. For many of us, we grew up being told that preparing our hearts involves us focusing on our sins to make, make sure that we went to confession to, before we took communion. And the side result of that or the side effect of that was that we took communion focused more on guilt, on our own guilt and condemnation. We took communion with a sense of unworthiness. <clears throat> and the Bible doesn't really teach us that that was the desire of Jesus' heart. Yet, biblically speaking, communion represents fellowship with Christ purchased by his sacrifice on the cross. That ancient symbol of suffering, humiliation, and death became to us and for us the symbol of love, grace, and the mercy of our Savior. Our focus this weekend as we prepare our hearts for communion is the cross. Here's what one Bible teacher had to say. Too many people, the cross is just a symbol for Christians that represents virtues such as kindness, peace, forgiveness. The cross does symbolize those virtues, but there is more than just symbolism represented by the cross. To many people, the American flag is just a symbol of freedom. Multitudes take only what it means to them to use it for their own gain and their own agenda. Then there are those that realize the sacrifice that went into our freedom. And there are the people that there are people who fought to keep our freedoms. So, so in a very real sense, there are many Christians that, and even people that claim to be Christian or would identify themselves as Christian. The cross represents the love, the peace, but there's more to it. Just like there's more to the American flag. The cross represents the price that was paid for our eternal freedom, freedom from the debt and the payment of our sin. The cross was a place of many things, and that's what we're going to talk about as we prepare our hearts. Now, we here use these little cups and the wafer and little cup of juice, but those of you that are watching at home or wherever you're watching from, please prepare yourself and get some type of a cracker or a piece of bread or some type of juice. If you have grape juice, obviously that would be the best representation. But have something ready because at, at the end of this teaching, we will take communion together. But remember, we're talking about the cross, that place of sacrifice, that place where Jesus demonstrated the love of God for each and every one of us. The cross was a place of suffering. Jesus was crucified. Crucifixion was a terrible death filled with much suffering. The penalty of our sin is suffering. But Jesus paid for our suffering for us. In other words, he took our place. He stood in our place. And the suffering that you and I deserved to endure, he endured on our behalf. They beat him. They spat upon him. They plucked his beard from his face. The cross is a reminder of a price that was paid. They put a robe on him, mocking him, drove a crown of thorns upon his head. The Jews thought that he came to conquer an empire, but he really came for death. He came purposely and willingly and purposefully with this one goal in mind, to pay for your sin and my sin. He came to redeem us. Isaiah 53, verse 3, describes Jesus to a T. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, the prophet is saying, we thought this person deserved this punishment for himself. Yet, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening or the punishment, we would say today, for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, that horrible method of torture that the Romans used, 
we are healed. Think about that. Think about the cross. Think about that place that stands forever as a monument, as a memorial, that place of execution where Jesus proved the love of God that he has for each and every one one of us. The cross is also a place of shame. The fact the cross was so shameful and disgusting to Roman society that it became the object of mocking and ridicule. I thought this was very interesting in doing some research about the cross. <clears throat> We're told that one archaeologist researching ancient Roman buildings reported that scratched into stone in the servants' quarters of the old Roman imperial palace on the Palatine Hill, this is in, in ancient Rome, is the earliest known image of the crucifixion. A cartoon, a graffito. To somebody, somebody as a joke, as a prank, as as, a, as some type of a mocking expression of what they believed, etched into stone, a cartoon. It was a person sketched raising his hand towards a crucified figure, which was towering over him. But the crucified figure has the head of a donkey. Blasphemous. Mocking. And the rough lettering below it reads, when, tra- when translated, it reads this. Aleximenus worships his God. Obviously, there was a slave, there was a servant, there was someone in the imperial palace that was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and probably tried to share the message of the gospel with others and talked about, spoke about how this Savior was crucified. Well, the crucifixion being such a shameful, horrible thing in the eyes of Romans, this person, in order to minimize that message in order to discount the message of the gospel. Scratched into stone, this blasphemous picture. But it goes to show you how the Roman society thought about crucifixion. And and because of this, because it's such a reminder of shame and ridicule, it's probably the reason why there are there exists no early depictions of Christ on the cross that have been found. In other words, the Christian community did not use the crucifixion, the cross, as a method of identification. It was too shameful. It was too repulsive. It wasn't until centuries later that the figure of a crucified one on the cross was used extensively in Christian churches. It was a symbol of disgrace and of defeat. Yet we know what the world calls disgrace and defeat, we call love. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, we we could say completer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such, here's that word again, endure, such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. We're told to remember all that Jesus endured, all he put up with, all he had to submit himself to for your sake and for my sake. Horrible punishment. Horrible punishment. Bible teacher Rick Renner had this to say about this portion of Scripture. The word shame is the Greek word, aeskune, which describes something that is base, ugly, revolting, and grotesque. It's more important that we remember the definition, not so important that we remember the word. But when the Greek individual read that scripture in Hebrews, when the person who understood Greek, which was the international language of that day, when they came across that word, ayaskune, they immediately were faced and had to deal with the, with the prospect that this scene on the cross was base, ugly, revolting, and grotesque. By using this word, the writer of Hebrews was telling us that Jesus' experience on the cross as he hung naked and broken in full view of the world was disgraceful, deplorable, despicable, and reprehensible. Something sickening. Paintings and sculptures all throughout the years and the centuries of the crucifixion always portray Jesus with that little loincloth, that little towel wrapped around his waist. But this was simply not the case. Romans were not so kind as to cover the male anatomy. 
Jesus was stripped of all clothing and hung naked before the jeering crowd. For a Jew who respected the human body as something made in the holy image of God and who abhorred the naked idols of paganism, this indignity was utterly repugnant and embarrassing. Imagine if you were beaten to a pulp and then hung, hung physically naked in front of your friends, your family, your coworkers, and acquaintances. How would you feel? And that's what that Greek word is trying to bring out to us and clearly show us a picture. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, tells us that the Lord Jesus felt a deep sense of shame and embarrassment in that horrific moment. The cross was a place of salvation. Thank God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross, or we could say some translation says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let, let's just imagine the sixth hour as the darkness fell on the earth. God turned out the lights to tell the people that they had mocked him enough. What happened in that dark hour? The gospels tell us that in that dark hour, every sin known to mankind was placed on Jesus. He literally took our place on that cross and paid our price, literally. Literally, it's not symbolic anymore. He did this. Jesus, who lived a pure, sinless life. If there was anyone born, born, born on earth that did not deserve the cross, it was Jesus. However, it was part of God's plan for him to procure, to obtain, to purchase the salvation that today we gloriously and freely possess. Wow. We owe such a debt of gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus accepted his assignment, but the Bible tells us plainly that he had to submit himself, knowing how much suffering it would cost him. He had to set himself, he had to position himself in such a way to endure this suffering as part of the assignment that the Father entrusted to him. In order to purchase our salvation, Jesus had to say yes to that period of suffering, those hours he spent in agony on the cross so that you and I would be able to come together and take communion, honoring him, bringing that sense of community that matter where, no matter where you are in the world right now watching this, whether you're local, whether you're in another nation, another continent, this draws our hearts together in gratitude towards our Savior who endured the pain, the suffering, the humiliation, the shame, so that you and I could be set free from sin and reconnected to our Father in heaven. I hope you realize that. And I hope that is preparing your heart. He endured, he submitted himself because he recognized this was the assignment for which he was born. I want to flip this and I want to bring another aspect of the cross. I want us to see that the cross is also a place of mercy. Mercy. Lamentations chapter 3, written by the prophet Jeremiah. And there's a very important portion of scripture here that I want to attach to the cross. Lamentations 3, verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23 says, for they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Let's talk about this a little bit more. Through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed. Through, we could say it this way, through the cross of Jesus Christ, you and I will not perish because of the cross, you and I do not perish. Because of the cross, we're not consumed. We're not put away. We're not done away with. We're not cast into darkness because of the cross. Because his compassions fail not. Compassion is an interesting word. Compassion means, that it, 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 maybe, maybe it's better for me to describe what it is not. Compassion is not pity. Pity is you feel sorry for someone but you don't get involved. 
compassion is. Your heart breaks for the condition of another and you get in that hole with them in order to lift them out. That is the cross, my friends. That is the cross. You would think, well, we would have pity on him being crucified. No, he was having compassion on us from the cross, knowing this is what it's going to take for me to get you reconnected to my father again. We've been trained to see the, the cross as a place of murder, the result of a terrible betrayal. You remember how Judas betrayed Jesus, which took place just a few days before. Yet the very same people who shouted crucify him were proclaiming his praise. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yet a few days later, they cried out. They demanded his crucifixion. Place of mercy. The cross represents the mercy of God because he did not have to do it. Jesus did not have to go to the cross. It was an act of his will. He submitted. He, he took upon himself the assignment that was given to him, but he didn't have to do it. But he knew if he didn't do it, you and I would be eternally separated from God in torment and unspeakable suffering. Jesus could have returned to heaven when he climbed up on that Mount of Transfiguration and he was translated into heaven where he spoke to Moses and Elijah. He was already there. He could have chosen to stay, but he chose to come down from that mountain and go to the route of the cross. Because of you and I, Jesus came off that mountain, came back from heaven, had been surrounded by the glory of God, yet he chose to come back down that mountain as an act of compassion. Jesus took no shortcuts in purchasing our salvation. He took upon himself, listen to this, you need to understand this, okay? He took upon himself the full wrath of God, allowing all of God's anger towards sin to come upon his body and to crush his soul. I want to say that again. He allowed the full wrath of the Father in heaven against sin to come upon himself in order to inflict upon his body every sickness, every disease known to mankind, which is a result of sin and to have his soul crushed emotionally. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out to God, is there any other way we could do this? Yet not my will, Father, but yours be done. Mercy is shown in his love abiding with us. John 15, 9, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love, abide in my love. To abide means to tarry, to linger, to continue to be present, to be held and to endure, abide. He said, abide in my love, yet he was going to abide in our suffering. He endured our suffering. He abided in our suffering. It's an endless love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. His mercies are new every morning, and thank God for that. And his love for us is great. Great is his compassion towards us. So every morning we can wake up with a new sense of a new beginning, a new sense of a clean slate. Why? Because of the pain and suffering that Jesus endured on that cross, naked, ridiculed, being mocked by the very ones he was dying for. Because of that, his love abides with us. It's a forever love. Again, Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's that abiding. There's that abiding. There's that commitment. There's that I'm in here with you. I'm, I'm coming into this hole. I'm coming into this hell hole called earth. I'm coming down to earth. I'm coming to this place that's under sin, that's under a curse. I'm coming here to rescue you, to pick you up, to lift you up 
and to bring you out of the sea. Not just to come to say, I'm so sorry that you're in sin. I'm so sorry that you're living a life that's of degradation. I'm so sorry that you're sick. I'm so sorry. Now that's not enough. He came down to lift us up. He came down so that you and I could experience relief. That is redemption and that is love. His mercy is shown in his dual role. Understand this. He's both our high priest and the very sacrifice itself. He's the high priest of our confession, according to the book of Hebrews, but he's also the lamb of God who came to take the sin of the world. He's both our high priest before God the Father and the spotless lamb whose blood was shed. He took our place on the cross. He bore every one of our sins and every one of our diseases. His wounds proved how much he loves us. Maybe I can bring it out clearer by using this this illustration, this true story from history. During the Napoleonic Wars, the wars that took place under Napoleon's reign in France, which upset all of Europe, upset the balance of power, brought destruction to almost every country in Europe. When men were conscripted or they were drafted into the French army, they were done, it was done by a lottery system. If your name was drawn, you had to go off to battle. But in the rare case that you can get someone else to take your place, you were exempt. On one occasion, the authorities came to a certain man and told him that his name had been drawn. But he refused to go, saying, I was killed two years ago. At first, they questioned his sanity. But he insisted that this was the fact of the case. He claimed that the records would show that he had been conscripted two years previously and that he had been killed in action. How can that be, they questioned. You are alive now. He explained that when his name came up, a close friend said to him, you have a large family, but I'm not married, and no one is dependent upon me. I will take your name and address and go in your place. And the records upheld the man's claim. The case was referred all the way to Napoleon himself, who decided that the country had no legal claim on that man. He was free because another man had died in his place. What a picture of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus Christ bore your sin on the cross, but you must take him. You must take, you must take that offer for yourself. You have got to respond. He bore our sin. If you turn to him, if you put your faith in him, if you put your trust in him, if you will declare with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, that you believe in who he is, you believe that he died on the cross for your sin, you will be delivered from the penalty of sin, which God would is justly imposing. That's what Peter means when he says, he himself bore our sins on his body on the cross. Do you recognize what's taking place? Do you recognize the offer that's being presented to you? Just like that man hundreds of years ago in France had someone else take his place, died on the battlefield, shed his blood. No claim could be made to that, to the genuine individual whose name was used. In the eyes of France, the man had died two years previously. Someone, a substitute, took his place on the battlefield. 2,000 years ago, a substitute took your place on the cross. And by his wounds, by his blood being shed, we're healed from spiritual disease of sin. We are healed of the physical diseases of the flesh. We're offered a new beginning. We're offered a fresh start in life. We're offered a clean slate. And in the eyes of God, he sees us as perfect, yet taking into consideration the weaknesses of our humanity. While we're on this earth, he works with us to bring us more and more to a place of separation from darkness, separation from sin, separation from the things of this world. Yet, all the while, enduring our weaknesses, enduring our sin, enduring our character flaws, he still sees us as perfect in his sight. In communion, we are celebrating and remembering the fact that Jesus Christ died 
to save us by taking the punishment upon himself. He in turn offers everlasting life if we will place our faith in him. I want to offer you that opportunity right now. I don't want to assume that everyone that's watching this broadcast is automatically already saved, has already received Christ. I don't want to assume that. Because there may be, even if there's that one person who I I know about Jesus, I've read parts of the Bible, I've been to church, but you've never made that official declaration of faith in Jesus Christ. And I'd like you to join me right now as we prepare our hearts for communion. The very first and most important step is leading you in a declaration of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we would confess with our mouth what we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. We shall be saved. Say this with me. Father, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he came to this earth to die for my sin and that you, Father, raised him from the dead so that I could have everlasting life. I declare right now that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. He is my Savior. He is my God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making me a child of God. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and take whatever you're going to use for communion. Take hold of a piece of bread that you have, a cracker, wafer, whatever it is. We're going to pray over this. We're going to pray a blessing upon it. And then we're going to take communion together. I hope that you're joining me right now, wherever you are. Father, thank you for your blessing upon this bread. Father, thank you that every time we see the bread, the wafer, the matzah, the cracker, whatever it is, Father, it is symbolic of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he allowed to be pierced for us, which he allowed to be nailed to that cross. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. I receive this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and take whatever juice or drink you're going to use. I'm also going to pray a prayer of blessing upon this, and then we'll take it together. Father, thank you for this cup and all that it represents, Lord. We remember that this cup is symbolic of represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the most powerful thing in the entire universe, in the realm of the seen and the realm of the unseen. The blood of Jesus that purchases us, that cleanses us, that causes us to be qualified to stand in your presence, Father, without any sense of guilt or condemnation. We receive this cup with thanksgiving in our heart, understanding that without the shedding of blood, we could never be free from our sins. Thank you that you did not spare the blood of your own son, that you allowed it and you permitted it to be shed on this earth. You received it in heaven as full payment for our sins bringing us back into relationship with you, Father. And we're so grateful for that. We receive this cup with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for allowing me to bring this message to you. I pray that you remember, I pray that you never see the cross again the same way. I pray that every time you see someone with a cross, see someone with a cross around their neck, you see a cross on a building, you see a cross in some type of a anything online, I pray that this message will come back, that you'll remember it, that you'll remember that it was a place of shame, a place of suffering, a place of sacrifice. But just as importantly, that it's a place of mercy, a place of grace, and a place of healing. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.